My name is Justin Miller. I am author of the blog Sex and Psychology, and I'm joined today by Dr. Lori Brado through Skype. Uh, I've invited her to talk to us a little bit about her new book entitled Better Sex Through Mindfulness, How Women Can Cultivate Desire. Uh, I invited Lori because uh, I think that this book is likely to be of great interest to many readers of my blog, so I wanted a chance to uh, sit down and talk to her a little bit about what's in the book and what people can take away from it. So hi, Lori. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so let me just give you a brief intro for um, people who might not uh, be familiar with, with your work. Um, but Lori is a psychologist at the University of British Columbia. She is the Canada Research Chair in Women's Sexual Health. And um, she's kind of a big deal in the area of sex research. Um, she has published uh, more than 100 journal articles. She's received millions of dollars in grant funding for her work, uh, numerous awards and accolades. Uh, so she uh, really knows what, what she's doing in, um, in when it comes to sex research. Uh, most of her work is in the area of women's sexual health, in particular in um, the area of women who have sexual difficulties with uh, desire and arousal. And she's done a lot of work looking at um, treatment and intervention options for uh, women who are facing uh, sexual difficulties. So um, uh, with that as our brief backdrop, um, the title of Lori's book, as I said, is Better Sex Through Mindfulness. So let's start there with the title, right? So you say mindfulness, and this is a term that we hear a lot uh, increasingly in the popular media, but I don't know that everyone's necessarily familiar with what it means. So what is mindfulness in lay terms? Um, thanks, Justin. So, so mindfulness very simply can be described as um, present moment non-judgmental awareness. So essentially it's about paying attention on purpose and deliberately, but it's also about how we pay attention. Mm -hmm. So unlike concentration training, which is simply keep redirecting your mind onto a certain focus, mindfulness has the added component that when we do that, when we pay attention, we're deliberately being kind to ourselves, compassionate to ourselves, And what that means is that we're not judging ourselves if our mind takes off a hundred or even a thousand times. We're also not judging ourselves for the content of the things that we think about or get distracted about when we're trying to pay attention. So it very much is a practice. Um, it's a skill we can learn, but it's also a way of being. Um, and what that means is we can take mindfulness, that practice of being present in a non-judgmental way, um, in really all the activities that we do, including having a conversation with someone else. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what mindfulness can potentially do um, for women who are experiencing sexual difficulties. So um, why does it work and how does it work? Yeah, so, um, you know, mindfulness has been around for millennia, for literally thousands of years, but it's really only been in the last uh, decade or so that um, our group, as well as others, have really tried to study, um, does mindfulness help improve sexual functioning? And if so, how does it help? So as a result of a number of studies in different populations of women, including women uh, survivors of gynecologic cancer, um, women with a history of sexual assault, um, women who are seeking treatment for low desire, as well as women who experience chronic genital pain, what we've found fairly consistently across those studies um, is that mindfulness practice results in improvements in in sexual functioning. So different measures like a woman's interest in having sex, um, her degree of satisfaction for the sex she's having, um, as, as well um, as a decrease in distress as a result of practicing mindfulness. And what that means is that women um, aren't distressed by uh, sexual concerns anymore, probably because their sexual function gets better with practice. Mm -hmm. um, and importantly, what we found is as we followed women over months after completing the treatment is that their sexual functioning actually continues to improve long after they stop the formal treatment itself. So when we assess women at the six month point, as well as a year out, um, they continue to have improvements in those domains of, of sexual function. And we believe it's because they've incorporated this into their life now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's become more than just a vehicle for improving sexual function, but they experience other benefits like better mood, 
uh, better ability to pay attention in conversations, less anxiety, better ability to handle stress, etc. So those are probably some of the mechanisms mm -hmm. um, by which my mindfulness is helpful for sex specifically. Mm -hmm. I think it was interesting what you were saying about how this is something that women incorporate into their lives. Um, so can you speak a little bit to how that might be different from, uh, say, taking a pill or a drug uh, to try and treat sexual difficulties? I know increasingly people seem to just want to take a medicine and doctors want to be able to prescribe a medicine because it's easy, it's simple. Um, so what are the advantages or benefits of a, a mindfulness-based approach over, say, trying to take a pill uh, mm -hmm. to, to treat sexual difficulties? Yeah. So, you know, first and foremost, I, I'm certainly um, an advocate for people having choices, women and men having choices. And, and for some people, that means having a choice to practice something that is more skills based versus something that's more pills based. Um, but they are really fundamentally different. And when we look at women specifically, um, the only medication that's approved in North America to, to improve sexual desire is a medication called Addy. Um, it does work on the brain. Um, and it's been found in research to result in an improvement in the number of um, satisfying uh, sexual events that women have. Um, so it is very much a, a brain medication, not unlike meditation, which fundamentally changes different parts of the brain, both the, the structure of the brain as well as how the brain functions and works. Um, but the medication, Addy, in particular, um, it, it hasn't been found to really result in quite significant improvements in multiple areas of the woman's life, like her mood, like her feelings in her relationship, her ability to manage stress. And this is where a mindfulness-based approach, um, in my opinion, really has some significant advantages. So while the two approaches and medication and mindfulness might both improve desire, mindfulness in our research has found that it, it's able to tap into so many other parts of a woman's life. The other thing that we don't know about um, the medication Addy is what happens after women stop taking it. Mm -hmm. And there haven't been any scientific data to show um, do their improvements in desire or sat satisfying sexual events, do those continue? Um, it's really a big question mark. Mm -hmm. Whereas with mindfulness, we've now demonstrated in a few studies that those effects can be lasting. Um, one uh, additional uh, kind of difference between the two is that there are a number of side effects in taking um, Addy in particular. So we know that it must be taken daily. It takes at least eight weeks or so to show benefits on desire. Um, and it's completely contraindicated with alcohol, which means that as women are taking the drug, um, they can't be consuming any alcohol because of um, concerns about a severe drop in blood pressure and dizziness that women might face. Um, thankfully, with mindfulness, we don't have any such contraindications um, that would make it uh, dangerous or, or unhealthy for women to use. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. Um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit uh, about the book. So what's what's in it? What's the approach? Is it more a review of the science? Is it a self-help guide? Is it a little bit of both? Yeah, so it's very much rooted in stories. So um, uh, I'm a scientist, I'm also a clinician. And um, so each chapter has at least a, a story of, of a woman or a couple um, that um, experience sexual concerns in different flavors and different ways, and how we've used mindfulness specifically to address that woman's concerns. So it's very much rooted in practical, accessible um, examples that I think readers might even see or hear themselves in. Um, and at the same time, the book is also rooted in the science. So um, it took me quite some time to get to a point of deciding to write this book, because in my opinion, the, the science really showing the benefits of mindfulness was not quite there. Um, now I feel um, fairly confident that the science is strong, it's compelling. And so the book sort of um, weaves these two facets, the actual stories, and then the science underlying some of those benefits throughout. Um, there are also a number of specific exercises described in the book. So in that way, anyone could pick it up, read through the exercises, and attempt to practice them at home on their own. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. I'm super excited to read it. Um, can you also tell us a little bit about kind of how you got interested in mindfulness in the first place? You know, what's the, the, the backdrop or story for how you started incorporating it into your work and then what ultimately led to the book? 
So I was first introduced to mindfulness um, when I was a psychology resident, University of Washington, and um, was working with patients at the time who had um, severe out-of-control self-harming behaviors. So people who engaged in a, in a lot of cutting, destructive behaviors, parasuicidal activities as a way of managing their mood and anxiety. Um, and so I learned dialectical behavior therapy, which is one of the leading treatments for um, addressing such activities. Um, and mindfulness was a significant part of the, of the treatment. And essentially, it involved teaching people that rather than harming yourself, um, really tune into what that distress feels like. Feel that anxiety, feel that sadness, feel that anger and irritability, and ride it out as if you were on a surfboard. Um, and it was such a compelling um, approach to using paying attention to control something that was so out of control um, that I became really intrigued. So I began meditating myself, um, learning a lot more about the sort of science and practice of it. And because I was also a sex researcher um, uh, as a student and budding sex researcher as an independent academic, um, I sort of had the idea, you know, why not apply this to many of the women that we see in the therapy setting who share some similarities? They talk about a lot of distress. They um, speak about incessant anxiety, about performance, fear of performance failure, um, uh, sadness and depression, about never being able to re regain their sexual response. So we started doing some experimentation uh, with the women that we saw in the clinic, as well as um, a fair bit of personal experimentation on myself. Um, and then we put together the kind of foundations of a treatment manual, and then it sort of evolved from there. Mm -hmm. So um, who is this book for? Um, is it just for women or uh, can men get something out of it too? For example, in terms of, uh, say, better understanding a partner's sexuality. Just tell us a little bit about the, the target audience there. Yeah, so it, it has women in the title because... Um, most of the science that we've done looking at mindfulness for sexual concerns has been on women, although not exclusively on women. Um, so I think the book is really for any individual who wants to improve their sexual response. Certainly any individual who finds themselves distracted, whether it's benign distractions like um, what am I going to make for dinner? What's happening tomorrow? What's on my social event calendar? As well as those more um, catastrophic distractions, things like what's going to happen if I don't have an orgasm? Will my partner leave me? So in that sense, it's not gender specific because women as well as men can relate to those kinds of concerns. Um, also, anyone who's curious about mindfulness, um, I, I think the, the book really speaks uh, to, to those individuals as well. So we've done a number of um, pilot studies of very, very similar mindfulness-based strategies for men. So men with um, situational erectile problems, so men who have no problems getting an erection during masturbation, but when with a partner, um, they experience anxiety and therefore either lose or, or don't get an erection. Um, and we find, we've found mindfulness to be helpful among uh, that group of men. We're now doing some research uh, using mindfulness in men who are prostate cancer survivors um, and essentially can't restore their erectile function. So mindfulness can be a really useful way of helping them to think much more broadly about what sexual pleasure is, uh, broadening the sexual menu, as, as, we, as we say. Um, and, and our preliminary findings in that work is finding it to be a really useful strategy as well. So, um, uh, again, although written for women, I think it, it, the, the principles and the techniques really apply to anyone. Yeah, that's great to know. So this is something that doesn't necessarily know a specific gender or sexual orientation that anyone could, could potentially benefit from uh, the information and material that's in this book. Um, so lastly, I just have one other question for you, um, without giving away too much from the book, because I want people to go out there and read it and engage with it. Um, do you have any quick tips or advice that you could offer to um, people on how to maybe increase mindfulness? Yeah, so it, it is a skill, which means that it's something that needs to be learned and practiced just as if one was going to the gym and exercising a muscle. You know, you have to lift weights in order to exercise that muscle. And so we think about mindfulness in the same way. It's something that we want to practice on a daily basis. Um, for someone who's listening to this conversation right now, they can even start by tuning in. How are you sitting? Notice the position of your feet on the floor. 
<clears throat> paying attention to your heart rate, paying attention to where you experience the breath sensations. So we can start in these ways in our life in general by simply, you know, catching the attention from where it is and really deliberately fully feeling what you're feeling in this present moment. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of um, fantastic guides and aids in the way of um, guided meditations on the internet, as well as um, books that that um, help teach someone how do we actually practice this skill in general. Um, some of my favorite ones um, are um, Happify, which is an app, um, as well as Headspace, and both of which could send you a new 10 to 15 minute meditation um, every day. So uh, I know for myself, I like to schedule it into my day. Um, and I know that at that time is I put everything else aside and that's my time to really practice that skill of, of meditation. So um, people can simply start right now. <laughs> that was great. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for that. That's a lot of really helpful information in a very short period of time. And I think a great uh, teaser for your book. So like I said, I'm super excited to read it. And I hope that you all go out and uh, get copies of it as well. Um, so thanks so much for, for joining me, Lori. And I wish you all the best uh, for much success with this book. My pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about such an important part of uh, who we are. Thanks.